course, I'm the director of the Academic Council and Enrichment Services for the School of Medicine. I'll talk to you about a variety of things today that feed into struggling learners. Yeah. And behind the podium. Yeah. Do there is a handheld. Do you want the handheld? <laughs> sure. I feel like Oprah. I feel like Oprah. <laughs> should be All right. <laughs> Instead of doing a presentation on struggling learners, I'm going to sing a show tune. Okay. Um, so the outline of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about different um, elements that contribute to why uh, some learners do struggle in the academic setting and as well as the clinical setting, and then some ideas about what you all can do as educators to try to mitigate those struggles. And then if we have time, we'll do a workshop scenario together and talk about some cases that you might want to bring up. So factors that contribute to their struggle include mindset while they're in the learning environment that I'll go into, student motivation, intrinsic or extrinsic, poor metacognition, problematic cognitive load, response to errors, long-term retention of information, and passive learning, and occasionally also accommodation needs uh, learners with disabilities. So to start off, mindset. A learner can have either a fixed or a growth mindset in the learning setting. They can have a fixed or a growth mindset in any setting. Uh, any individual can. And it's not a black and white situation, uh, shades of gray. And an individual can uh, go from being fixed to growth and back to fixed. It really is um, a, a flow. It's not a, you park in one spot and that's where you stay. So the reason this is important in the learning setting is because when an individual is fixed mindset, meaning they were raised to believe that you are born with a certain amount of intelligence, you came into this world with what you got, you're either smart or you're not, um, whereas a growth mindset individual has been raised to believe that knowledge can be cultivated, the mind is plastic, you have the ability to increase your knowledge base, you, have the you may not ever be Einstein, so to speak, but you do have the ability to get smarter uh, through effort and, and struggle and trying and making strides. In the academic setting, the fixed mindset individual doesn't want to struggle. They think struggle is for mortals and they're a smart person. This isn't, struggle isn't for them, whereas a growth mindset individual is like, Okay, this is not so fun, but let's see what I can do to figure this out. Let me power through this moment, learn from it. Same with effort. A fixed mindset person doesn't like effort. Again, effort is for mortals. I'm a genius. I'm smart. Learning it for me in the past has been effortless. It's been easy, and it has reinforced my belief that I am smart. Whereas a growth mindset person doesn't necessarily think they're not smart, but when they hit effort, when they hit challenge, their confidence isn't hampered by it. It's not diminished by it. Instead, they're like, all right, let's sort this out. And Carol Dweck does a lot of work in this realm, and one of the studies that she's done in the not-so-distant past was with a researcher named Bozier. And they studied individuals' brains while in the moment of challenge, academic challenge. And what they learned was that the anterior cingulate cortex, the error processing part of the brain, in a fixed mindset individual was dormant, quiet. The individual was basically trying to flee the scene mentally. Whereas the growth mindset individual, that area of the brain was firing on all cylinders. The individual was engaging in that space and wanted to understand what they had done wrong and what they could do in the future to improve. So when you're working with the learner, if you're finding that they're fleeing the scene mentally, that's really important to be paying attention to because there are things that you can do to foster a growth mindset within this individual and an environment, an academic environment, that in and of itself fosters a growth mindset. I'm not going to go into cognitive distortions, test anxiety, and um, because I only have a half an hour. <laughs> but um, I do believe that they are related concepts. So if you have a learner that spends a whole lot of time with maladaptive um, responses to perfectionist tendencies, then you might want to do some exploration into the topic of cognitive distortions so that you can help your learner. Same with text anxiety. And then I consider test anxiety the byproduct of other things, not something within itself. 
So one of the things I believe that to be a byproduct of is a fixed mindset response to errors. Performance approach to goals is a learner who wants to prove to you they're smart, wants to prove to you they know it all. And what happens in that space is they attempt to try to learn everything, and so they end up with this bullet point knowledge base, this random collection of facts that they struggle to be able to apply. And again, that's a fixed mindset tendency in the learning setting, whereas the mastery approach to learning tends to be more growth mindset, and that's an individual that engages in the space, wants to understand the foundation and build upon that foundation in a more robust way. Yeah, they, they're still going to know fun facts, but they often apply those fun facts uh, much more effectively. So in the uh, learning setting, in the learning setting, um, one of the ways to foster a growth mindset is to have a culture that allows the learner to know that they don't have to know everything. Uh, the fixed mindset is really encouraged by something like, you should know this by now. A growth mindset approach to that would be, all right, let's, let's work on this. This is something I want to make sure that you master this month, this week, this rotation. Um, make sure your know, learners know that it's um, okay that they don't understand things perfectly. When um, um, there's this fine line that a learner walks between admitting what they don't know and looking like they don't know stuff. And so you want to help them navigate that fine line effectively because you want them to admit to you what they don't know so that you can help them learn it. Whereas if they admit it to and on that same token, if they admit it to you, try not to punish them for admitting it to you in the latter, fee in latter feedback. Their knowledge base is weak. They asked a lot of really dumb questions. So be, be mindful of how, um, so set the stage for them to talk to you about their weaknesses, but keep it growth mindset oriented once they do admit them. The power of yet, I want to mention that before I switch slides. Um, the power of yet is, okay, so you don't know that yet, or in a learner, I don't know that yet, it leaves the door open for cultivating that knowledge. It's a very powerful word. So when you do approach a learner who is very down on themselves about their inability to learn a topic, and, and you're in a place where you're trying to encourage them, keep in mind the power of the yet. So learner motivation. Um, again, a very complicated topic that I'm trying to sum up in just a couple minutes. but. A learner can be intrinsically or extrinsically motivated and, um, in the learning setting. And one of the things that Erica wanted me to talk about today was the disinterested learner. And so that is a, a learner who, in, me, in the medical student context, is somebody that wants to go into something else. And so I'm going to focus on the music model of motivation specifically to address this topic. The music model is designed by a professor at uh, Virginia Tech and it has five components that are each built upon a variety of learning theory and uh, education constructs. But they all come together to really provide an educator a way to motivate a learner in the learning setting. Specifically, empowerment. Does the learner believe that they are empowered in that learning setting? Do they have ways by which they can contribute to the learning environment? Usefulness. Do they believe that the content that they're learning is useful? For the disinterested learner, the answer to that is no. But are there ways that the educator then can create um, ways for the learner to believe that that information is useful? Yes, you may not want to be a pediatrician, but some of the information you're going to learn here is generalizable. Your interactions with a family, your building rapport, all of these things can be used in a variety of different contexts. So allow is fostering that usefulness. Success. Does the learner believe that they can be successful with the content? Because a learner who believes they can be successful is going to be more engaged in that setting. They're going to be open to risk. Again, that gets similar back to the mindset piece. Interest, do they find it interesting? Again, um, it, do they, not only do they find it interesting in the short term, but do they find applicability for it later? And then caring, do they believe that the person who's providing that education cares about whether or not they learn that content or not. Now, in each of these spaces, an educator can engage 
with a learner to try to foster a sense of empowerment, the content being useful, feeling successful, and so forth. So I encourage you as educators to keep that in mind. Now, let's say, so growth mindset environment, we set the stage, everybody's motivated to learn, now what? Now is when metacognition has to be the, the goal. Metacognition is the learner's ability to think about their own thinking, and struggling learners don't do this very often. And so they need somebody else to help them make it happen, or at least draw their attention to the fact that metacognition is something to think about. So when a learner needs to improve their metacognition, what you do, can do to help them is essentially set the stage for self-directed learning. And with that comes task awareness. What's the task? I need to learn pediatrics. Okay, that's a really big task. Let's break that down into more proximal goals. I need to be stronger with my ability to recognize and diagnose pneumonia. I need to be better about my ability to recognize and diagnose cystic fibrosis and so forth. Work on them on identifying the task. Then work with them on identifying the strategy by which they can address that task. What resources have you used in the past to learn this task? Let's talk about those resources and whether or not they might be the best ones to use in this moment. And then performance awareness. How is the learner performing once they've identified the task, identified the strategy to approach that task, and then attempted to learn it through that strategy? Did they, in fact, learn it? And they need feedback. They need feedback from somebody that isn't them because learners are often very poor self-assessors about what it is they are good and not so good at doing. So what you can do, this is the learner who doesn't know what they don't know. So what you can do is you can foster this cycle. You can work with them. Again, what is your task? How can I help you identify that task? How can I help you approach that task? Kevin Ava just recently did a presentation for TEACH. I don't know if you all were able to attend it, but he gets to this um, piece about learners being poor self-assessors, and I highly recommend you do a quick Kevin Ava TEACH Google search, and it'll pop right up. I created a link to it in case you want to uh, just pull it off my presentation. So what's um, the best way, again, ask the learner, what's the best way to approach this topic? and then engage them in that chosen approach. Question them about whether or not the approach they've chosen is the right one for them. They've told you, well, the last time I tried to learn about cystic fibrosis, I watched videos on pathoma. Okay, well, how effective has that been for you? Uh, well, obviously not that effective. I still don't know how, to, how it presents. I don't know how to diagnose it. I don't know how to treat it. Okay, well, let's try to identify a better way for you to learn that content together. And so, uh, and then revisit it with them. Make sure that they know that you're going to double back on this and touch base with them again about whether or not they've, the strategy that they have identified is, has been successful. Cognitive load theory. When a learner is learning information, their working memory is being taxed by a variety of different types of cognitive load. The working memory can only handle so much at one time. And the types of load that it is being challenged or tasked to address include intrinsic load, the actual content itself, extraneous load, everything else that's going on in the space, whether people are talking, eating, walking about, um, how this uh, individual is speaking that's presenting the information. And then germane load, the part of the working memory that still needs to be available after those other two things have been accounted for that allows the individual to say, wait, what? Why does this matter? How is this useful to me? In what way would I apply it? And so in the learning setting, in medical in particular, you can imagine how the intrinsic load routinely, um, in and of itself, is going to tax a learner's working memory and their ability to have space for the germane load to get a word in edgewise. So there are things that you can do as an educator to try to minimize and mitigate this intrinsic load. And what those things include are spaced versus mass learning. And this concept essentially means if you have the opportunity to take a giant task and divide it up into smaller pieces, then please do. Uh, if, it's not always possible in the medical education setting, but when it is, Ideally, try to do that. Um, the brain likes things in small doses, and the studies indicate that individuals who hear 
massive amounts of information in one setting perform long term less well than individuals who hear smaller amounts of information over a wider amount of time. So um, when you're presenting, you need to cover everything you're trying to cover. Or could you have the students do some pre-reading prior to that moment in time or the residents do some pre-reading prior to that moment in time and then focus specifically on one of the more complicated elements within the topic area? Or can you just truncate it and, again, spread it out over a designated amount of time? Is lecture the best format? Is there a better way to deliver content to a learner? Is it the best format? Identify what environment and what context is going to be best for the type of information you're trying to get learners to understand. And I refer to this as Pomodoro teaching. If you can give learners a break every 20-ish uh, minutes, uh, it will work really nicely for them. The adult attention span is about 20 minutes long, and so uh, if you can try to be mindful of that as you're working with them when it's an option. Again, not all settings lend themselves to it. But if, when you're at the bedside, um, a number of, limit the number of teaching points for each patient. That's um, one of the suggestions Erica made. Um, and so, again, giving the learners the opportunity to just digest a little bit at a time. Extraneous load when you're presenting. If there is a way to present it with fewer words, then that will be lovely, in particular with graphics. So if it's um, a cycle or um, a, a flow of any kind, a pattern of any kind, that can be shown via an adjunct display, that might be best for your learner. And if your learners are struggling with a topic that is process-related, flow-related, cycle-related, and they reoccurringly um, prove that they don't understand it, even if Doctors awesome and super smart have created their own adjunct display for this concept that you've told the learner to read. Have the learner recreate it themselves and say, I would like for you to recreate your version of this and paraphrase things in your own way and, and do this because it will help them. They, they could look at the pre-made one a thousand times and learn twice as well if they make it themselves. So not the, Save it for when it's a topic they struggle with. I'm not saying do it for everything, but, but definitely something to struggle with. And so, when, again, when you're presenting, do you have to include everything you're trying to include for the learners? Sometimes educators will be so um, concerned about leaving out something important that the learners need to know that they give learners more than is necessary. So make sure you look at your own slides with a critical eye and make sure that you take out things that you don't necessarily need to include. And the when and where of working with uh, learners at the bedside, what's going on? Is it a busy hallway? Is there a lot of noise? Is there a lot of distraction? Have you already covered a, an, um, a vast amount of content? Pay attention to the environment around and what's going on. That will help the learners understand it. There's not too much extraneous load. And then again, promote environments and methods that uh, provide a space for the germane load to have an opportunity to do its job. And so give the learners that have an opportunity for the learner's brain to say, wait, what? Why is this important? How will I use this? And encourage learners to do that when they're doing questions. It's not uncommon for learners to do questions in busy hallways, in areas where they're like, I'm just going to power through a few of these questions and have some really important learning take place. That, that's not a thing. Um, when a learner does questions, they have to be mindful about what it is they're trying to learn from that space. If it's content that they're strong in, sure, fine, do some questions in, you know, when you're in a busy hallway. But if it's material that you actually need to learn, if it's a struggling learner, then you need to be doing questions in a quiet space by yourself where your brain can do its job. And then while doing those questions, you need to allow the germane load to do its job also. And then in that space, you want to say, what did I get wrong? Why did I get it wrong? What did I need to know to get it right in the future? Really engage in that space and encourage your learners who are doing questions to keep this in mind. Ask your struggling learners to take on the role of the educator. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but when a learner, a struggling learner is learning, because of the other things I've spoken about a moment ago, they don't have task awareness, 
They don't have strategy awareness. Sometimes they're fixed mindset. When you ask them to teach, you create an environment where they're like, you want me to teach this? Okay, how do I explain this to somebody else? And it causes them to create a structure for themselves so they themselves learn better and for maybe for the first time, um, the concept because they format it in a way to explain it to somebody else. They put first things first and then supporting details and they, they will effectively create this. Now I'm not sending, saying feed them to the wolves and have them create this presentation and then just appear before their peers. Certainly double check it for accuracy, but have them put be the presenter, have them be the educator, put them in that role and it will help them learn the concepts that they need to learn more deeply. At the end of rounds, ask your learners what they learned today. Um, this ties into the one minute preceptor concept. Really engage with them in this kind of way. This is a fabulous tool. Um, and I included another video because it's explained very well um, by the Mayo Clinic in this Take 5 video. But um, get them to tell you what they learn, what, get, get the commitment. Did the learner provide, um, get them to provide an answer. And when they commit to something, this is powerful because and they're owning the information, they're owning um, a diagnosis. And then ask them to back it up. Why do you think this? Give me some evidence. Give me some reasons why you think this to be true with this patient. And then say, okay, now, what other possible diagnoses could it be? Play, you know, work through the steps of this one-minute preceptor with them and, and employing these other concepts I've mentioned in terms of the growth mindset and, and the, envir the positive environment for learning and correct mistakes. When you're working with a learner, and I'll talk about this again in a second when I get to deliberate practice, but correct mistakes on the fly when they make them. It's a fundamental tenant to the deliberate practice model, but I'll say it twice because it's really important. <laughs> but um, everybody's brain leaks. Um, there's, whether they're a struggling learner or not, everybody's brain leaks. Um, and a, an individual's ability, retrieval practice and storage strength, I mean, retrieval and storage strength will um, vary over time. Retrieval strength is their ability to come up with the information on a moment's notice. Their storage strength is their ability to retain it long term. The more a, a learner loves the content, the more intrinsic value they place in the content, the stronger their storage strength is going to be over time, the less they enjoy it the less engaged, interesting they find it to be, the, small, the shorter window of time that storage strength is going to be. Um, so when your learners are struggling, help them identify which content they don't, they do or do not like. What's their relationship with those individual pieces of content? Because if they don't have um, a positive relationship with it, if they don't find it engaging and interesting, they're going to leak it faster, and so they are going to need to see it more regularly and they can't procrastinate it until five minutes before they need to perform on an exam. So that gets to the spaced repetition. Everybody has to revisit information. In the uh, journey from being a novice learner to an expert learner, you have to dial, you know, double back on what you've learned. And when one does that is really very much dependent upon um, the relationship with the information. And, and so, again, the information that you have a strong rapport with, you don't need to see as often. But the information you're weak at, you're going to need to see more regularly. Gamification in education speaks to this um, graphic here, cartoon. Um, essentially, when you can, make it fun. Um, make it that learners will um, <laughs> always engage when it's fun. And, um, and it will help them maintain the memories relating to the concepts. Kahoot is an online quiz tool that um, residents and medical students are both going to be familiar with. So you can have them. It's free. You can have them make quizzes for each other. Uh, you can make quizzes for either group. Um, but again, it's a, it's a fun way for them to engage in competition, which all medical learners love, except for the ones that are fixed mindset and don't want to lose. Um, <laughs> So, um, but again, catch them in uh, making mistakes. Um, the disorganized resident, um, help them when they're not putting first things first. Interrupt them and, 
in an emotionally intelligent way as possible, interrupt them and say, you know, hey, let's, let's stop you right there. We want to always make sure we're putting first things first and a better order of operations for the information you're presenting to me would look more like this and or here's some resources relating to a better way to do that in the future. Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours, 10 years, 10,000 hours. Erickson talks about deliberate practice. Yes, you have to spend a great deal of number of hours and years to become an expert at something, but if you don't have the deliberate practice piece, the correction along the way, the guidance from somebody who's better than you, then you're going to do it exactly the way that you learned how to do it over and over and over again. And if the way you're doing it is wrong, you're just going to get really accomplished and really fast at doing it wrong. And so it's really important for somebody who's more skilled and knows a better way or the correct answer to interrupt you and help you navigate that moment of cognitive dissonance and improve your performance for the future. And so when you're working with learners, definitely interrupt them. Sometimes it's helpful if it's a near peer or a peer that's helping a learner. And so sometimes you can assign a coach to a student and have them work with this individual on a regular basis because attendings don't always have the time to be doing some of the things I'm talking about. But maybe a, a resident could be doing that for another resident or a medical student for another medical student. And again, having the learner that's struggling teaching the other individual can be very effective in improving their performance because, again, they're going to look at the information in a different way, possibly for the first time. Reflection and elaboration goes back to the one-minute preceptor. Again, it's just encouraging the learner to think about what they're doing, what they're saying, and giving them uh, the opportunity to improve on it. Access, good, we're going to have plenty of time. So access and accommodations, sometimes learners um, come into the learning environment with a learning disability, attention deficit disorder, um, processing delay issues, um, dyslexia, dyscalculia. Um, what these individuals need most often is more time and not being put on the spot. Uh, individuals um, who struggle with learning disabilities often just need patience. And, and so if an individual is struggling with a learning disability and also has some of these other topics that I was discussing, they don't have the ability to identify the task, they don't have the ability to identify the appropriate strategy, things are to some degree confounding. And so giving the learner time and resources can be very effective. And so I included in the packet a variety of resources that are not just helpful to learners with disabilities. They're helpful for all learners. Um, but I definitely want to make sure that if you know of a learner that you're working with that does struggle with um, a learning disability, make sure they know about those resources in particular. Um, but, the, but the resources in there are handy for everybody. So in sum, I put you to sleep, wake up for this last bit. <laughs> um, Encourage learners to embrace the challenge. Um, learning is supposed to be difficult. Researchers Bjorn and Bjorn uh, talk about um, desirable difficulties and the fact that if it's easy, you're not learning. You're looking at words on paper. You're watching um, a video. Um, you, it's supposed to be hard. You, if you need to be engaged. And when, it, when you're feeling challenged and when you're engaging in that space, that's when real learning is taking place. And struggling learners often very passively like, okay, I'm just going to do more reading. I'm going to watch a video on it. I'm going to read an article on it. But it's, it tends to be very passive and very disengaged and oftentimes hurried um, and on sleep deprived minds. And so it's really important to try to do some things to reinforce an active engagement, encourage them to set goals, encourage them to establish strategies to approach those goals. You want those goals to be as proximal as possible. And then struggle. Tell them it's okay that they need to struggle. Ask, ask them to ask questions while they're learning. Why is this important? How do I apply this? How is this useful? What do I do next? What would be the follow-up? And then get them to perform the knowledge that they've gained. Embrace the feedback that you're going to give them, whether it's good or bad, and then modify the approach as they need to. You've got to help them do these things because if you don't do this, then they're going to do more of the same and they're going to have more of the same outcomes. Questions so far? 
have a question. So I think it's the confounding part of that is something that has possibly a defined or a university, um, but also has a fixed mind to set it to come through. And the difficulty in trying to help that person be able to do something that has been done in the moment and very rapidly and very quickly. Um, and I struggle with that all the time in knowing how to help that person and how to help that person. And I feel that some people are not suited to that for certain um, tasks because we cannot do those kind of things. But I was wondering about what the mindset is when you have to help that person in my mindset about um, how to help people in that way with medical education. So, in the, in the medical school level of medical education? Um, sure. <laughs> or resident education. I think, it's, it, it, I think this is one of the things that we all struggle with because um, those who are the difficult learners, in which case they have confounding issues, um, never know um, how much energy uh, is going to be required to put in, how much energy is too much energy, and when should we actually start considering whether that person is actually in, in the right tech or in the field. That is a really complicated question. Um, I think that when a, a when a learner arrives at the doorstep, um, there's going to be two different, well, more than two probably, but for now, I'll just say two, two different possibilities. One, they are going to be very upfront about a learning disability that they may have, and the second, they are not. And, and so, what if a learner is upfront about the learning disability that they have, then I think it's really important to have a conversation with them about accommodations that they've received in the past, how to for them as a learner in the medical uh, undergraduate medical education setting, um, and how might they look at the graduate medical education level. And, and sometimes that's a matter of, I need extra time on an exam, or um, if um, in rounds and a faculty member is going to be quizzing us um, on the rounds, then give me the opportunity to um, think for three to five minutes before I answer a question. So pose the question at the beginning around to the end of this. After we see this patient, I want each of you to be able to tell me X, Y, and Z. Give them a window of time during which they can put together their thoughts. Or um, if it's about going over an article, maybe you're going to have a group discussion, discuss a case. Could they have the case the night before so that they could look it over at home? Um, prior to the day of. So there's, there's going to be different things that can be done to help them at that doorstep and then see how those things work and where tinkering might be necessary. Um, whereas the, the learner who doesn't present at the doorstep and tell you what their learning disabilities are. Time is going to transpire and it's going to make matters worse to some degree because the, the learner is not going to tell individuals are going to potentially get frustrated with the learner and, and, and time has been lost in how the learner can be helped and the problem has gotten confounded by I'm, I'm now self-conscious, I don't think people like me, I feel like the weakest link and so um, ad additional issues are now um, confounding um, as well as the learner is getting more progressed and so they're now not they haven't learned what a first-year resident should know by the end of the first year. So that's a whole lot harder scenario. Um, when you, it starts to become evident this learner is struggling and I think there's more to it than poor time management, then um, talk, meet with them, talk to them, say, this is, it's your private information, however, I want to just put this out here. If you have struggled as a learner in the past, it would really help me help you if we talked about some of the things that maybe precipitated that struggle. And we have resources here at the school. I can send you over to Emily and she can meet with you and talk about some different resources that exist. But that learner would still need to give you the opportunity to help them and give you the opportunity to establish some of the things that this other student A that I mentioned uh, was having the advantage of benefiting from. But there will, with any learner, there comes a point where there's technical standards that have to be maintained in the medical setting. And if those technical standards are at risk of not being met, then very difficult conversations become necessary. But there's a lot of journey between 
those two spaces. Thank you. Um, a couple of the learners who've really struggled have just said it's very helpful for them if, um, if we have that learning environment where they feel like they're, it's a safe place for them to acknowledge that they have a learning disability or that they learn differently. And so again, just creating that safe space is really important. And then it's helpful if you have time during your orientation to ask people things like, um, you know, like how do you learn best is the kind of a question that um, allows them to maybe tell you that they have difficulty with certain things, um, that, that that can help them a lot. Um, and then, you know, then trying to help them have that growth mindset where um, maybe they acknowledge that they learn differently or have a disability, but that doesn't mean they're incapable of, of learning. It just means they might have to work harder or learn differently, but that they can still grow. Um, and I, I think the, those situations where people don't have time, that extra time to think are really hard. And I, I think the only thing to overcome that is probably extra repetition and practice um, so that you don't you don't have to take that time. The only way to get around that probably is just over and over and over again, um, practicing those skills. Found that. And so they find out largely by each other. But you make a really good point about something that could be added to the third, uh, the end of the second year, um, in terms of a more formal uh, offering by uh, the institution in terms of what to expect. I think that that helps set clear expectations yeah. and might, um, might actually increase those kind of bi-directional talks between yeah. our preceptors, our clinical preceptors and the students yeah. um, so that we're using the same kind of language in some ways yeah. and that we each understand each other when, when we say, what are your goals yeah. right, today? Right. You know, yeah. what kind of what goals do you yeah. have for today for this rotation? Because yeah. I think that um, if, if we press them, and they already come in that day knowing that they might have had a responsibility for their own learning. <laughs> like I, I need to come up with a few calls that I want to bring <coughs> in Dr. Amoroso's clinic, then that, that might create better conversations and better use of everybody's skill set. Yeah. We can probably reinforce that with a resident orientation mm -hmm. too. Certainly we have residents that have, have that. Teach me what I need to know. Yeah, teach me what I do. Well, I do the exact opposite. Because when they come in to get oriented, my comment to them is, this is for you, not me. I mean, it is. I mean, I'll tell you whether they're there or not. So maybe I need to ask them what they want to learn. <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is with the students, they've already been here for two years. And even though it's a very different setting, Someone is aware if someone is struggling in the first or second years, and if they're struggling in their first or second years, chances are they're going to be struggling in their first or fourth years. And or if they're struggling in their first year, and you can kind of work with them and find out what works with them, then that would be a student to say, listen, when you're doing that rotation, this is something that you need to talk to providers you're working with because this really works well for you. It's a little different than other people, but it's working for you because, I mean, help them, helping them be their advocate if they do struggle earlier. Yeah. What works for an individual is absolutely important. You're 100% you're right. And it's not uncommon for learners to, who don't know, um, who are struggling, who don't know what they don't know, uh, to look to somebody else and be like, how did you learn this? And what did you study? What did you look at? And while that is not necessarily a bad idea, what matters most is what's going to work for the individual and, and identifying that and then doing that. So yes, you're right. We don't have that with the, we don't have that with the residents at least in the first two years. Does anybody smell the room with them? And because I I I really um, I guess I have been here a very short period of time, so I don't understand the kind of opportunities that we have for sending our residents. I, I know you'll, the medical students I feel get taken care of primarily already because they're, they're, they're a distinct group. You monitor them carefully as Laura said during those first few years. And our residents come in and they're, they're brand new and, and like, like, yeah, they are. And so do, are they offered the same type of ability to go into your office perhaps and have an evaluation 
if we feel that they are having some disease. We send a lot of folks out and it's very, very helpful. Um, yeah. um, anybody is having, um, like, looks like that they have um, sores or if somebody's struggling clinically, um, then we you know, offer. I see a lot of residents, an occasional fellow, occasional attending. Really, because all this is way past the one minute precinct. <laughs> this is time that uh, we clinicians may not necessarily have. We have two weeks or four weeks, four weeks of patching time with those residents and two weeks students of them. You are right. You are right. And I think that the, the best advice I can give where that uh, is, is very true would be in moments with basically salt and pepper these ideas in places where they will work. Don't feel like you have to canvas all of them. Be strategic about select ones and, and place them in spots where they can be um, handy. But yeah, you're right. There's too many, <laughs> too many other duties that's assigned to feel like all of